The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon uh, or good morning or good evening, wherever you are. This is um, Rebecca Oliver from Future Earth speaking. Future Earth are very happy to be recording this first webinar from the SDG Transformations Forum. Um, we have three speakers for you today um, and um, an, uh, an introducer um, who will um, tell you a little bit about this series of webinars. Um, and that is Per Ulsum, the Stream Leader in Transformations from the Stockholm Resilience Centre and um, also part of the SDG Transformations Forum. So the way that this um, hour will pan out is that we have three speakers who will speak for about seven to, to ten minutes each. Um, and during the time that they're speaking, you can send in your questions uh, for the discussion coming up. Um, and I'll be able to see the questions that are sent in. And then when the three speakers have finished, I'll open the floor for questions and I'll be asking you to, um, to, to speak and tell, say your question and who your question is to, um, and um, we can unmute you at that point. But until then, the, um, uh, please do send in your thoughts and your questions um, using the, the question button, which you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. And I'll now give the word to Per Olsson, who will introduce this uh, webinar and introduce our speakers. Per. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to introduce it because Steve, who initiated this, uh, is speaking himself. So I, I introduce it uh, this series for him, and I've been in, in, involved a bit in this transformation forum. So I will just say that this series of, of um, of webinars is a way to get together the SDG kind of network of people and the network uh, around transformations to sustainability. Uh, and transformations to sustainability is a, a rapidly emerging field, getting uh, a lot of attention, a lot of funding at the moment. And in the in the context of SDGs, I think it's SDGs are very promising and a global effort to to actually achieve some uh, important uh, transformations, but it's not a, it's not we're not done yet. Uh, so it's just uh, the SDGs is kind of a start of things, but we really have to think about hard about how they can have a transformative effect instead of just being something that is uh, grinded into existing paradigms uh, and uh, and frameworks. So um, we're going to talk about this uh, in a couple of webinars and. And uh, today we have three speakers. Um, we have uh, Karen O'Brien, who is a professor at the Department of Sociology and Human Geography at University of Oslo, Norway. We have Derek Lorbach, uh, he's a director at Drift. Uh, he's a professor in social economic transition at Erasmus University. And there was a fire truck or something going by. Um, and then we have Steve Waddell, who is the initiator of these webinars and, and also um, with his own organization, Networking Action. So with that said, we're going to have Karen presenting uh, first. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. Great, thanks. Um... Yeah, um, it's great to be here and be part of this first webinar. Um, I just wanted to say, whoops, share my screen. Um, my interest in transformation really kind of is linked very much to research on climate change and um, especially the research on what climate change means for society and for human security. And so in looking at like winners and losers and the adaptation, um, the relationship to globalization processes and everything, it really became clear to me that if we want to um, avoid dangerous climate change and the unprecedented risks, we're going to have to do a lot more than just mitigate and adapt to climate change. We're going to have to transform at a rate, scale, magnitude, and depth that is really um, um, unprecedented. So how do we do this in a way that is ethical, equitable, and also sustainable? Um, over the years, then, I've become more and more interested than in the change dimension of 
climate change, transformation in particular. And um, the definition that I use for transformation is very general, but it really recognizes that transformations is physical and or qualitative shifts in form, structure, or, or meaning making. And um, this is, I think, important because it recognizes that transformation isn't just about a quantity of change, it's also about a quality of change. And um, sometimes we think that just any big change is transformational, big you know, urbanization um, programs or agricultural development programs. And um, what, when I look at transformation, I like try to see that it's also that change in perspective, that change in meaning making. Now, when I approach transformation, I tend to use these, what we refer to as the three spheres of transformation um, as a way to kind of structure the thinking, but also to um, kind of make sense about of the interactions between the practical, the political, and the personal spheres of transformation, um, because these are always interacting. And the bullseye or the target of this is very much the practical sphere and these are the behaviors and the technical responses that that are really achieve the goals that we have such as the SDGs or the Paris Climate Agreement and they're often very you know the things that we can actually measure like um, you know more solar panels higher bridges more people riding bicycles etc and a lot of the effort um, in transformation um, processes goes into that very practical sphere. And in fact, um, and most of our efforts are towards achieving the goals that we've um, designated. But we also draw attention then to the political sphere, which is the very systems and the structures that facilitate or impede changes in that practical sphere. And the systems and the structures, we call it political because this is where you know, you've got to negotiate what type of a system you're operating with and um, how you're going to be um, using that, who decides, and that's where you get conflicts, it's where you get social movements, it's where um, you really have to decide, should we, you know, what is um, the goal of our system? And often we get stuck in the political sphere with very different goals and very different objectives for the system and very, you know, different ideas for the, what the practical measures have to be taken. And that's because we often ignore the personal sphere, which I think is the um, of as the um, individual and shared beliefs, values, worldviews, and paradigms which we operate from. It's almost the operating system through which we see the system and through which we decide what kind of um, practical outcomes we want. So um, all together, these are acting, and often the beliefs and values and worldviews and things are implicit, but not necessarily um, recognized, especially in the political sphere. Um, often, if you say that we should be looking at um, these belief values and worldviews and paradigms, people say, yes, we need to change them, and they put it right into the practical sphere. But what we're really trying to say is that we need to be aware of how these different views and perspectives influence power, politics, interests, and also the practical applications. Um, these three spheres map very well onto what Danella Meadows refers to as leverage points for system change where she's looking at, you know, how do you actually, you know, what measures can make big changes in a system. And if we look at that practical sphere, the constants, parameters, numbers, and size of buffers and things, we see that those are where a lot of the effort goes. Um, and she places higher leverage on systems change, the structure of information flows, the rules of the systems, et cetera. And, um, but what we're also interested then is the goals of the systems, the paradigms from which systems arise, and also the power to transcend paradigms. So looking at how these all interact and interface with each other, I think is a really important part of transformations. In my own research, I'm um, very interested in what the relationship is between individual change, you know, personal changes, different ways of seeing things, and collective change. You know, how do we actually change society and um, cultures as a whole? I'm also interested in what role creativity and empowerment play in transformation processes. Um, because we know that, you know, to, to actually, um, you know, a lot of the action has to happen in that political sphere, in the systems and the structures that will enable transformations. So that's become a really important, um, you know, aspect is how do we, how do we um, mobilize people as the solutions to climate change? Um, and finally, or, is in what ways do political agency and collaborative power promote transformation? 
And here I'm referring to the capacity to actually have a bigger impact and to work with people who don't necessarily share your own beliefs, values, or worldviews, you know, your mind, the, the way you make sense, or your action logics um, of the world, um, how you see the world. Um, and this brings me to the last question is, you know, how can the transformation of scientific paradigms themselves contribute to social transformations? And um, what here I'm thinking about the, you know, very deterministic, atomistic, materialistic um, worldviews that have kind of got us into the problem in the first place. So if we start to look at what's emerging in, um, in, in the, the field of, um, you know, new materialism, agential realism, quantum social theories and things, how can those actually enable and engage people with um, solutions and transformations to climate change? So I'll stop there and, um, you know, be happy to be joined in the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, that was excellent. I'm just looking to see if any questions have started uh, coming in. Um, I can't see any at the moment, but please do feel free to do that. Um, uh, and I think at this stage we'll move on to the next speaker, um, who is, and I've just sent through the chat, so hopefully everybody has uh, close to hand the short bio for each of our speakers, uh, Dirk Lorbach, uh, Director of DRIFT. So we can take a look at the chat box and see more about Dirk. And um, now I'll just hand the uh, presentership over to Dirk and make sure that you can hear him. Okay. Um, I guess it's uh, about now. Yes. Uh, thanks. I'm yes. Uh, thanks for joining in. Um, a good day uh, to wherever you are. Um, I will pick up uh, basically where Karen uh, stopped uh, with this idea of a changing scientific paradigm um, and maybe a different role for researchers in these tr uh, sustainability transformations or transitions. A bit of a disclaimer beforehand, I'm a, a professor of socioeconomic transitions and uh, uh, I'm leading a research institute at uh, Erasmus University in the Netherlands. Uh, some colleagues call us activist researchers. Uh, that is uh, mainly because we engage ourselves uh, very deeply in all sorts of experiments uh, in trying to figure out um, what new alternatives are emerging and what the direction of these sustainability transitions, transformations um, uh, might be. Um, uh, I use the word transitions rather than transformations. I like uh, the fact that uh, uh, and there's a whole uh, separate debate going on. Uh, what Karen said, uh, it's about a qualitative change in complex systems. In transitions research, we are very much interested in the underlying dynamics, mechanisms, and patterns of such a qualitative, large-scale uh, systemic change. And we look at societal subsystems, like uh, you might think about more socioeconomic systems, like education, labor markets, healthcare, um, uh, education. You can think of more socio-ecological uh, systems and uh, uh, associated approaches, uh, uh, often framed in terms of resilience, like forestry, fisheries, agriculture, or uh, more socio-technical approaches typically look at um, systems like energy, mobility, um, uh, water management, and so on. Um, uh, what we share in the different types of approaches and, and perspectives that are, are uh, co-joined in the transitions research is this interest in the underlying mechanisms uh, and patterns uh, that drive systemic change. And we draw a lot on ecology, on complex systems theory, but also on ideas from other disciplines like psychology on personal uh, transitions. Um, and these kind of disciplines give a lot of insight into these underlying mechanisms. So transitions are a complex long-term process of change that are non-linear, so they are disruptive, they are emergent, so they are not planned or straightforward. Um, and central concepts in transitions research are these ideas of regimes and niches, so incumbent ways of organizing a system 
and radical alternatives that we might conceive as experiments. I will talk about it in the next slide. So there's a very analytical uh, way that we try to understand these large-scale transformations that we all want. To some extent, um, these sustainability transformations, we talk about them because of successful transitions in the past. So a lot of the research is also based on looking into past transitions and try to understand um, how they emerged, how, how they were uh, organized. This brings me to the second element that is important in transitions transformations research, which is the uh, question of agency. So again, there are different ways to think about and to approach agent, the role of agency in transitions. There might be more analytical, there might, might be more evaluating interventions, and they might be more experimental. I will talk about the latter um, in the next uh, few minutes, um, but to give you an idea, uh, these approaches try to understand why transitions sort of emerge, how they are initiated, but also um, what influences their course and direction. So issues of power, um, the role of discourse, the role of experimentation are all uh, typical topics of, of governance type research in, um, uh, in the transformations, transitions area. Um, and if you combine that, um, we work a lot with this definition of transitions. So that it relates somehow to uh, how Karen uh, defined transformation, uh, but we try to be a, a bit more specific on um, uh, the sort of co-evolved um, uh, structure, dominant structure in the system. So we call that a regime. Um, that has elements of culture, so values, paradigms, culture, discourse, that has structural elements, they might be physical like infrastructures, but they also are the rules of the game that we uh, uh, agreed upon uh, collectively, so there might be policies or economic conditions, and uh, they involve practices, so they, uh, you might think about routines, professional routines, but also consumer routines, lifestyles, and so on in uh, different sectors of our society, uh, over time, we develop towards a, a dominant, uh, it's dynamic, uh, so there's a lot of change going on, but certainly dominant types of uh, regimes. So, for example, a central fossil-based energy regime. When we look into the dynamics of these transitions, um, what we see is that um, they can be understood as uh, processes of interacting patterns of build-up, of innovation, of emergence, and patterns of breakdown. The normal condition uh, um, in a, a relatively stable uh, situation is a, a situation where we optimize the existing, so we improve regimes through efficiency increases, innovation, and so on. Um, so. In a lot of our sectors, we see um, at the same time that the sense of urgency and the pressure for larger scale, more rapid change is causing all sorts of frictions. Because um, from this context of an optimized system, it's very hard to make radical, sharp uh, or short uh, uh, term radical changes. So what happens is people start to experiment with alternatives, and it can take years or decades for these alternatives to mature. Um, and this then, in a, a real nonlinear disruptive systems change, start to coincide. So the pressure from society at large, the building up of crises and internal tensions within the regime, and the emergence of alternatives. So what we see now in the energy domain is this um, convergence of pressure, internal crises, and uh, the breakthrough of alternatives. Of course, this has implications for how we deal with these processes as a society, but also um, as researchers. Um, and that's the final, uh, may maybe main point I want to make, that these transitions, transformations, are so large-scale, uncertain, uh, ambiguous processes that we cannot um, um, approach them in a traditional planning and, and policy kind of way, but also not in a traditional academic way. Um, 
a big part of these transitions is how we collectively as a society understand them, what we recognize as problems, um, what we value uh, in terms of experiments and alternatives, and how we progress away from a situation that we find unsustainable. Um, and what we um, experiment with uh, at Drift, but also more broadly uh, uh, within the transition research, um, is what we would call transition management or strategic niche management. It's using research um, and using the scientific process of problem structuring, formulating hypotheses, um, designing a, a sort of future uh, images and then experimenting with these kind of questions and trying to systematically reflect and learn and from there move forward um, to translate this process to um, society and basically um, organize action or activist research processes of experimentation. And a big part of it is trying to create coalitions of actors that are within regimes or niches trying to advance and accelerate transitions. Basically to create networks that um, make this paradigm shift explicit, come up with narratives and uh, guiding visions uh, with which they can uh, uh, engage others in these processes of experimentation. So basically I think uh, um, on the one hand there's a very analytical challenge of uh, trying to better understand the dynamics and the role of agency in these transitions in a more academic way. Um, but my message would be that the only way to do that in a rich uh, empirical but also in a socially relevant way is by actually starting to experiment with these ideas together with front runners, change agents and practitioners. So become part of these transitions. Um, it's a, a way to get a, a lot of a valuable knowledge and insights into these domains and the possibilities, but it's also a way to actually contribute to accelerating and guiding these sustainability transitions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, Dirk. That was excellent. We have uh, some questions coming in, um, and um, I'm wondering if we start the conversation before or after Steve uh, uh, has put his uh, thoughts on the table. So um, I think probably we will we'll continue to plan, even though they're interesting questions, and I can see um, that they'll they'll enrich. I think we'll carry on with Steve, and then we'll open the floor. And, um, and have a full conversation. So I'm going to hand the presentership to uh, Steve now. And um, please, you, have you have you received the invitation to be presenter? There we go. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, fire away. On tech, uh, just to give you a context for how my perspectives arise, uh, I uh, am not at a, uh, an academic institution, but like the other two presenters, I combine um, academic uh, sort of questions with uh, practice uh, in an action learning, action research way. So I'm particularly focused upon this question, this concept of large systems change. And by large systems change, um, there are two qualities um, that we emphasize. Uh, simply, uh, it's large. There's lots of people, lots of organizations, long time frames, multi-level. And uh, my particular work is often global. As well, uh, large system change has this concept of transformation as a core part of it. That is, there's sh system change. It's not uh, uh, that realizes uh, transformation. Um, the uh, work that I've done in global networks, global action networks, um, has been with, uh, as, as obviously, with structures, institutions, evolving processes. How do we create large system innovation in developing new relationships? 
Uh, a lot of that has to do with what was already spoken of it by Karen in terms of identity. Uh, people really are uh, shift their identities to new organizational forms and ways of acting. So just to be uh, more specific about what I mean uh, by uh, large systems change as transformational, um, I often use this particular table to be able to distinguish between uh, transformation and other types of change. And this is simply the language that I give to it to try to distinguish um, the different types of change. Now, other people might use these words of incremental change, reform, and transformation differently. I'm just wanting to be clear about the way I use it. And it's grounded in a theoretical perspective that was developed by Ardris and Schoen, working at MIT and working with a lot of, of uh, business organizations in particular, who developed the concept of single loop learning, that is asking questions about how we can do more of the same, um, double loop learning, um, which is trying to do what I call reform. Um, so you have a system and you're asking how can we change the structures or the processes within the system. It does not really uh, relate to the concept of uh, transformation, which was not actually a concept developed by uh, Arjus and Schoen, but by others um, in triple loop learning. And it's much more a basic question about deep reassessment about core assumptions. I'm just hearing somebody type. You might um, uh, silence here, uh, please. Thanks. Um, so how do we make sense of this is one of the core questions, you know. So one way to shorten this distinction is incremental change can be described as change in the box. Um, it's like Starbucks uh, developing a new uh, branch. It's change, but it's done it many times. There's sort of a template. We just go out and do it, do more of it. Uh, there's this uh, concept of uh, reform, which is asking questions from looking at the box and saying um, how we can change it from outside the box. And transformation is, uh, so that's often associated with organizational change or policy reform. And transformation is really asking questions about, well, actually, maybe it's not a box. Maybe we're the way we're actually looking at it and thinking about it is part of the way of what's inhibiting us from realizing our highest aspirations and greatest potential. So the importance of distinguishing between these different types of change is that they require different actions. So uh, the archetypical actions I have down here, uh, incremental change, you know, Starbucks example, they're copying, they're duplicating, they're doing more of the same. Um, the actions in reform, as I mentioned, are, are adjusting, adapting. Um, it's a lot where what are the uh, adaption in climate to climate change uh, comes about. Um, the transformation and is really to do requires visioning and experimenting and inventing, as Dirk um, emphasized with the experimenting. So they require different tools. You know, these tools are, and they have different dynamics, and so the importance is that you need a suite of tools that are around envisioning for transformation, whereas uh, in reform, it's about mediating between the current power holders and uh, figuring out how you might reorganize the current system. And in incremental change, you know, falling back on the Starbucks example, they've got to do some sort of negotiations to buy the land, to get the office space, etc. But it's all within a negotiations logic, as I describe it. So if we understand these three different types of change um, from this perspective, it allows us to ask questions, for example, about what is the relationship between these three types of change? So many people ask me, well, isn't incremental change, uh, can't it lead to transformation? And I will point out just the way I'm using the word incremental here, it can't lead to transformation. What incremental change can do is uh, create such pressure upon the system within which you're working and the assumptions you've made that you end up realizing you do need a reform or a transformational uh, way to approach the issues. So, for example, 
a lot of the change in uh, responding to environment and energy use is all about how we can increase energy efficiency. It's not about um, framing it as how can we actually create a zero carbon environment. Um, and so it's, uh, I would argue that it's not until you get to uh, that question that you're really talking about transformation. Now transformation and experiments can be small scale, um, you know, the, around a, a very particular question, or they can be large scale. For instance, Germany has been experimenting with the question of electricity and electricity reform, and it's been doing that for about uh, 25 or 30 years on a national level, but it's really an experiment. So we need these large scale experiments. Um, Dirk was uh, speaking to this as well. So what are some of the questions that arise uh, from this perspective? Um, this uh, LSC, the Large System Change Perspective, was introduced in a special issue of the Corp Journal of Corporate Citizenship, and uh, the editors, we developed this particular um, perspective, which harkens to Karen's perspective as well. We noted that people who made submissions were talking about change happening at very different levels. And people tend to say that this is the right place to, this is where change is really going to happen. Um, and a lot of methodologies are predicated upon change starting at one place. For example, um, Otto Scharmer, who has a wonderful methodology with the U process, it really starts with individuals and about individuals' orientations and seeing the world. Um, the Germany example with electricity, it's really starting with the technology as well as a perspective on um, what the limits of that of the traditional technology are. And, uh, you know, Germany has a particular skill and orientation towards technology. Um, and so this was a, a place that made, resonated with them as where they could move ahead with transformation and begin there. Sociopolitical economic institutions are often the focus as well. Uh, for example, the case I uh, write about uh, as an example is, uh, in, is uh, apartheid, ending apartheid in South Africa. Notably, that did indeed change the political system, um, but in fact, it's had not so much effect upon the social and economic system. But nevertheless, in the political sphere, it was definitely transformational. Um, societal means, values and beliefs. So um, this is uh, an area where change can happen and it's the focus of a lot of NGOs and movement organizations. And we have this great example over the last few years of marriage equality or same-sex marriage, which is not, um, which is really a, a belief uh, basis about what marriage is, what makes marriage legitimate. And then of course uh, we have a large number of people who are focused upon the needs of the natural environment and the limitations of that. So one of the questions, obviously, is what's the relationship between all these types of change? How do they fit together? Because inevitably, the technology starts, um, uh, produces change in the political systems and the socioeconomic systems, etc., and is related to beliefs. So there is an interaction here. Um, as we have, well, we have these other questions um, that I won't go into detail right now, but uh, welcome you to raise them in your own question, in your own um, discussion here that we, I look forward to. Thank you. Super. Rebecca? Yes, Paul, that was, um that was a record breaking with all speakers keeping wonderfully to their to their times which leaves us with um, a good good amount of time for questions and a lot of questions have come in so um, the panelists can see the questions I think in their chat box um, but I think Per maybe you have some ideas about who um, who we can ask to to pose their question first. Yeah, should I? I have some here. I can just start by by uh, reading one, and um, and uh, I'm gonna take one from um, uh, a question from Jendo Jigbu Jigbu uh, asking why why let's see let me see I lost it here um, 
why do you say sustainability transitions are uncertain and unmanageable? Uh, explain the unmanageable part because transitions seem to have been managed successfully or unsuccess unsuccessfully in countries like Germany and South Africa, politically speaking. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that because I, I, I said that. Uh, um, but the, the main thing is that why we say they are unmanageable because uh, in a traditional sense, sense you cannot uh, plan them straightforwardly. Um, and uh, there is, in a way, the way that we conceptualize it, no one in control. So policy plays an important role. Uh, but there are all sorts of other elements that also factor in, like behavior of consumers, uh, political shocks, external events, social innovation. Um, and over, we are talking about a timescale of, of maybe decades. So by definition, that is not a, 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 the future is not predictable in that way. That also creates a lot of space. If we look be, uh, back into the past, we certainly find uh, transitions that are, were more or less successfully managed. Um, and there's a lot of debate now about uh, uh, and a very interesting work in the UK on uh, the possibility of um, uh, making uh, rapid transitions. And every research comes up uh, by identifying the role of policy and uh, transition-oriented policy as a very critical element. So what we say is you can certainly influence the speed and direction of transitions, uh, but learning and uh, reflexivity, like Steve uh, uh, um, uh, mentioned, is a, a, a critical element in that because it's it's sort of trying to figure out and experiment away from a situation that we know and control more or less to figuring out a new more sustainable equilibrium um, so we um, yeah maybe the others also want to add something on that well I, I think it's super maybe we should move th uh, through the, the questions a bit because so allow people to ask uh, several questions if you don't feel like it urging need to, to reply to that. I also want to add to that that we sometimes talk about navigating instead of controlling or managing, right, Derek? That that there is just, it, they're navigatable, uh, but that's a word that uh, sort of acknowledge the uncertainty and, and uh, that you have to be able to switch game plan maybe in, in midair, you know? So it's a, it's a very good question, very good discussion. I, I, we're going to try to actually have um, Hillary Bradbury. Can you, can you post your questions? I think it's nice to hear the voices sometimes. So Hillary, uh, can you ask your question that you had about um, transformations that you posted? Yeah, Hillary, I've um, tried to unmute you, but it looks like you're muted yourself. So if you want to pose your question yourself, uh, do unmute. Otherwise, we can read out your question. Yes. Maybe we you can. Two yep. seconds. <laughs> All right. So right. She, Hillary, Hillary says like this, how do you understand the global sweep of Trump, Duterte, er Erdogan, Brexit, etc. Are these examples of transformation an old or new regime? And more important, what are leverage points for change? That's a nice question. So who wants to jump on that? Karen or Steve this time? Yeah, I can I can take I can start with that. Maybe Steve can follow up. But I think that um what we're seeing globally is is really a reaction to transformations as much as a transformation. And it's a, it's really important to rec rec recognize that transformations are not always considered desirable by everyone. In fact, they can be very dangerous and unsettling. So often you have, um, you know, anytime you're trying to change a system, you get pushback. You get interests that are going to be disrupted because this, the existing system does work for some people. And, you know, some people are making, you know, are really benefiting from it. So, um, so I think what we're seeing then is that, um, you know, that there's a, a tendency to kind of keep things the way they are rather than um, allowing 
things to change. And many people would say, oh, transformation is, is you know, written on the wall, but it's it's not necessarily, as Derek point out, pointed out, it's not a linear process. You, you know, it doesn't necessarily, it can have setbacks. Um, and I think, um, you know, what we're seeing is then that more and more people are becoming mobilized and empowered to actually, you know, because what's at stake is so large, um, many people are, um, are starting to recognize that yes, we are the system, and we, you know, how to go about changing that. So, um, so I think it's a really great question, um, and to consider that systems change is uh, transformations are very political. Um, it seems to me that uh, there's a couple, uh, there's two different uh, groups between the ones that, that were mentioned there. Duterte, I think, is a product in the Philippines of a system that was not working and there wasn't a transformational approach suggested or um, uh, people fell back into an old model of uh, just acting out or um, violence um, which was not what I would associate with um, transformational either positive or negative. The other cases seem to me to be more about what Karen is talking about and one of the qualities that transformation is associated with for many people is a deep sense of loss and destruction. You know, we, uh, people who are working and attracted to change and working for transformation are often inspired by the collaborative potentials and the positive possibilities. And yet, you know, I think of my father-in-law, he's uh, really loved the 1950s and thought that was great in America. And I uh, say to him, well, it wasn't so great for gays and lesbians or women or black people or all these other people. But there was a sense, a palpable sense of loss, um, nevertheless, uh, by that particular older white uh, male generation. So we've got to understand that um, loss and destruction are part of transformation. It's not simply a wonderful process of everyone getting together and deciding to move to a new future. Yeah, that's a good point. I like that also in, in Derek's presentation. So uh, should we move on, Derek? Is that okay? And, yeah. uh, I have. Yeah, um, I can add something, but that's, uh, that's okay. Oh, oh, okay, go ahead. No, I think the, 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 the role that we try to seek also as researchers is to, uh, uh, to use uh, envisioning, experimentation, uh, reflection as a way to uh, um, um, make people aware of the opportunities of transformation and the positive sides, um, but also to reflect on uh, uh, the necessity to engage people in this process because I certainly agree with what Karen and Steve are saying, uh, uh, transformations, they represent a, a, a threat to the vast majority. So that's an underlying cause of a lot of uh, uh, populist or, or negative uh, attitudes towards uh, uh, change. Um, at the same time, they are also political. So um, it's also a responsibility, I feel, of the research community to address the positive uh, um, excluding or negative social effects that might uh, happen uh, uh, during these transitions. We have a lot of companies in the Netherlands now that are starting to advocate rapid transitions, but mainly from a business agenda that they uh, see new business opportunities. Um, so the struggle for what a sustainable future is and what the outcomes are is, is uh, um, it's emerging right now. Yeah. Thanks. And next question, Paul Seitz, are you there? Can you um, post your questions? Because it's actually directly linked to or related to the SDGs, which this seminar webinar series is about. So, Paul, are you there? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentations. Um, uh, and thanks, Steve, for reconnecting with me on this. Uh, my question, it's a hard one, but a broad one, but how, how I, my view is that there's a global movement underway uh, to uh, support the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Uh, it's in its early stages, I would say, uh, but governments, civil society, the private sector, academics, a wide range of stakeholders are churning on this. Uh, how do we? How do you all see that? And how how does this thinking about a transformational kind of opportunity? Uh, can, how can we seize that or harness that, or navigate that? I guess is the better word. Yes, 
<laughs> Thanks. Well, Thank I, you. Uh, I have to say that's one of the uh, major reasons that some of us have got together to develop this concept of the SDG Transformation Forum, um, because we think that it's a, an excellent example of where there is an opportunity to do something in the transformation arena. And one uh, of the requirements uh, for really realizing large-scale change is that there be some opportunity for developing coherence and a sense of moving in a similar direction. And that's uh, the sort of uh, latent promise of the, uh, or more explicit promise of the SDGs. And so uh, the danger, of course, is that it gets trapped in the incremental activity and that the transformational uh, promise is lost. And so that's why the SDG Transformation Forum is developing as a multi-stakeholder perspective uh, because we need to get out of uh, thinking this is a government responsibility and to think of it as a multi-stakeholder responsibility uh, and opportunity to realize the type of transformation uh, we really need. Great. And I'm going to thank you and I'm just going to move on a bit because we have several questions so I'm going to just uh, continue if it's okay with everyone there. Uh, of the panelists. So, uh, Rupam Shukla, uh, can uh, can you pose your question? You think? Otherwise, I'll do it. See if you can unmute yourself, or if Rebecca can. Yeah, Rupam, you should be unmuted. Is your microphone working? Maybe, Per, it's best if you read it at this yep. point. Yep. In a system where there are no incremental change, rather the system is highly destable, such as mountain agriculture system, what kind of transition or transformation can be expected in such systems, which often remain void of any technological, political, um, uh, sorry, I dropped it, political, uh, political and developmental changes? That's an that's a important question because there are, of course, different contexts for transformational change. Anyone want to jump on that? Yeah, I, can, I can give a, a short reflection. Uh, I, I don't completely understand the question other than uh, uh, how does it occur, transition, transformation in different kind of contexts. So. Um, Transition is, a, is something that periodically happens in complex systems, um, but not all the time. So even in unstable systems, so we, we also look a, a lot to transition dynamics in developing uh, uh, world contexts, we can uh, identify a dominant uh, situation, equilibrium, a dominant regime. Um, within which there might be more or less fundamental change. So the starting uh, point would be a reverse question. What is the dominant regime? Um, and what are alternative niches? Um, and there's a lot of systems that are uh, and transitions that in which technology or infrastructure are not really um, uh, leading. They are much more behavioral or uh, um, uh, about lifestyle changes or about different types of uh, uh, routines or professional practices. So um, I, I think how we try to use this transitions frame is to look at, at uh, mechanisms and patterns, uh, but that always needs to be translated uh, to the specific context at hand. Maybe Thank Karen you. also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I can just add because I think I think that's a really good point um, about that. You know, transformations means different things to different people, groups, or places. And you know, what's transformational to um, in one situation may not be transformational in another. And it really depends on you know the values and what's desirable for a, a, um, a community or a sector or, or something. So to be able to take into account you know the that wider context, but also the um, you know where people are at and what they're what is transformation to them and what is desirable is really important. Thank you. You have a uh, uh, Mark here, Mark Bardi. 
uh, can you try to unmute yourself or uh, yeah can you hear me yes hi mark hi um, so I, I fired off a couple questions there mm -hmm. uh, uh, of different take topics. One. Um, take the best one. Okay, I guess I, I'm curious as to where there, there's two major um, intergovernmental processes underway, the IPBES and the IPCC. Uh, and I'm wondering, the, the, um, the special report that the IPCC put out in 2012, the SREX report, uh, pushed the conversation forward uh, on transformation, and the work of Karen, and also like Mark Pelling and whatnot. So, I'm wondering where you see opportunities uh, emerging in these intergovernmental um, platforms or panels with the AR6 or the IPBES uh, upcoming, if there's more attention being given um, to the kinds of visions that uh, uh, you've been talking about today. I can start with that. That's a, a really great question and a, a good question mark for the AR6. Um, one of the things that I think um, happened with the fifth assessment report of the IPCC was that the whole concept of transformation um, became very controversial because some countries said we don't we don't want to be taught we don't want to be transformed again you know we don't want to have the green economy imposed on us or your ideas of what transformation should be and so um, we spent five days in the plenary talking about what the definition of transformation should be and and it became um, really like the hot you know the topic that that a lot of people just wanted to stay away from in the synthesis report. And so I think it has to come, you know, with the 1.5 report and the AR6 and almost that we have a mandate from, you know, we do have a mandate from the Paris Agreement. So it would be very interesting to see exactly how, um, how it's approached and to what extent um, the research on um, socio-technical transformations and socio-economic transformations is actually pulled into the solution space for um, climate. And I think, you know, what we tried to do in the SRX report is um, exactly show those um, single loop, double loop, triple loop um, processes and incremental versus transformative changes. And I think we're not going to get much farther in IPCC and IPBES unless we actually start to, um, you know, take transformation very seriously. Thank you. Right. How much uh, time? I, yeah, Derek. You well, want to it's it's it's, that? it's uh, uh, that's the reflex. Uh, uh, we don't want uh, another transition or transformation imposed on us. But I think there's also a political explanation that uh, policy by itself is a, a part of a regime and and has an incremental tendency. So uh, uh, there is also a big debate in the Netherlands about uh, uh, trying to ignore the possibility of transformation happening to us. So we try to separate uh, the transformations that we want, so discussing on what are uh, desirable futures, desirable options and so on, and trying to identify uh, the uh, pressure, uh, the transitions that are emerging because of these increasing pressures on sustainabilities and these uh, increasingly competitive alternatives. So you can uh, uh, don't want an energy transition like Trump, but the fact is that the renewables are cheaper uh, uh, in, in a lot of parts of the country already than coal. So you can deny it, but that is happening. So that's a different question from um, what do we want to do with it. So I hope that is being uh, taken up as well. Wonderful. And uh, Rebecca, we, uh, what do you think about time now? We want to. Yeah, wanna it's it's, it's a bit of a shame because there's so many excellent questions. So we have four minutes left. Um, I think that we should um, mm, either have one last question or give the word to the three, uh, a last quick word to each of the three speakers. Um, I'm trying to read your faces um, as to what you would prefer. Maybe we take one last question, and as you answer the question, we have one last comment from each of the speakers, and then we can uh, round it off, and I can give a little bit of information just at the end. So, Per, okay. which is the last question? Hannah Gosnell, are you still there? If you have, or if you're there, try to unmute yourself and... Um... You had a small oh. question there. Hi, yes, I'm here. I had you had more a small question. 
Yeah, it was just a specific question for yeah. Karen. And it might be too specific for this last question, but I was just curious about Karen's use of um, other, you know, drawing on social theory and, and the idea of quantum social theory to help her understand transformation. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that probably will take more than 30 seconds to answer, but, yeah. but, I think it, yeah. but I think it's a great question because it really is, you know, about everything that we're talking about here is about challenging our key assumptions. That's what transformations really are driven by when we start to look at a system differently. And quantum social theory is really, you know, looking at what would social change theories look like if we actually develop them today rather than, you know, in the time when Newtonian mechanics was... Um, was really dominant. So it's really using a lot of, you know, metaphorically, but also in, you know, how, what, you know, what reality is there in terms of, you know, entanglement and complementarity and the fact that individuals actually do affect the outcomes of the experiments and things. So I think it's very exciting because it just means that we're starting to ask more what if questions about um, social change. And I think that that's how social change happens is when we start to really see things differently and see that human beings actually matter in terms of, um, you know, making transformations for better or for worse, but hopefully for better. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Quick answer to a big question. Should we, should we um, continue then with the last couple of points from the other panelists? Um, well, maybe I would just emphasize the importance of the opportunity that uh, we have to really push uh, this transformation capacity that we've developed. I find that most people are not thinking about it that way. Uh, they aren't aware of how much progress there's been made and how to do this. It was sort of, uh, but it's a huge change and we've got to really um, advance this uh, uh, more powerfully um, into uh, the general world and the general way of acting. And of course, there's lots of questions that we have uh, that we uh, about uh, transformation that we still need to develop. So I'd just like to encourage people to join um, with us in this SDG Transformation Forum to uh, um, advance these social change opportunities and others. Correct. And there will be more webinars coming. Derek? Well, maybe, maybe to end with an optimistic uh, note, I, I certainly uh, I want to relate to what Karen just said, that, that uh, um, I, we see a lot of examples uh, um, across the globe of people, communities, initiatives, actually uh, figuring out what these new future sustainable uh, um, uh, regimes might be. So there's a lot of uh, uh, emerging transformation before it reaches the level of large systems change, uh, that might take a while. Uh, but the way that we get there from these local initiatives to large systems change, uh, that is part of the experiment. Um, so um, I, I think uh, one of the ideas that we use there is this translocal diffusion, um, local communities that connect globally. Uh, and I think uh, that is uh, the beauty of these kind of webinars, but also of what, what researchers can do, uh, play a role in connecting these initiatives, transferring lessons, uh, and adding to this growing network uh, uh, of uh, transformative communities. And, and that is how I think the transformation uh, might progress and uh, might evolve. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Per, for helping cope with the avalanche of, um, of questions. We now have hit 5 o'clock and have actually passed it, 5 o'clock here in Stockholm anyway. Um, I propose that we consider making these um, webinars maybe even two hours long. I think that's... Uh, certainly something we can think about. I wonder how many people would uh, would join for that long, but I think we should try because the questions have been so excellent. So what I'd like to say before I close is um, is that there is a um, an open network powered by Future Earth. If you um, search Future Earth Open Network or find it through the Future Earth website, um, there is a transformations community on that uh, network. And I will collect all of these questions and I will post the questions um, there on a, on a document. 
And I think I'll ask um, the three panelists if you'd like to have a look at the questions and answer. Um, obviously, it depends on how much time you've got and whether any of the questions particularly fire you up um, and see whether we can um, post those answers on, um, on the open network as well and keep this conversation going um, so that it's um, alive and, and kicking all the way through to the next webinar. Um, I'd also like to say uh, you've seen, I hope in the chat, I've posted um, a, just a reminder of the Transformation 2017 conference, which is in Dundee, uh, Scotland, um, on um, August the 30th, 31st, and September the 1st. There will be some Transformation Labs, T-Labs, held on the 29th of August that are open to everyone, even those non-registered. So um, I've put the website there. You can go and have a look and get involved. Um, there aren't that many places left there. But there's plenty of opportunities coming up, I think, for this community to grow and to connect. Um, and that's definitely a focus for Future Earth, that transformation becomes um, a, a better known body of knowledge and uh, practice so that all of the things that are happening um, in response to this, this new agenda, the, the SDGs, uh, that we aim to make that transformation, transformational with all of the knowledge we have. Thank you so much, everybody, for all of your um, uh, active participation, dynamic questions, and, um, and for joining today. This uh, the recording from this web, uh, web webinar um, and the slides from our three presenters will be on the Future Earth website, um, and there will be a an email going out from the from the webinar system to give you a link to that. So um, with that, four minutes late. Uh, thank you all very much indeed, and I hope you keep um, your uh, attention out for the next webinar, which will be announced shortly. Thank you very much indeed, and um, and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.